Kau ki te mihi mihi ka mihi au uh, ki nga mana whenua o tēnei rohi, uh, ka mihi au ki nga ahurei, uh, ko Angela Wanhala tōku ingoa, uh, no kaitahu mi airani ahau. So it's an honour to speak to you today uh, about my research, uh, much of which has to date focused on the impacts of colonisation and colonialism on Māori women, families and communities, uh, mainly during the 19th century. Now I've approached these histories through an examination of interracial marriage in New Zealand, uh, through a critical study of colonial archives and Māori women's writings, particularly their letters and petitions in the 19th century. And I've looked at the impact of land dispossession upon families. And I've also been interested in colonial uh, visual and material culture, and I've uh, especially focused on the history of photography. But today, I'm going to discuss a collaborative project on the histories and legacies of the Māori home front during World War II. Uh, this project is one that I co-lead uh, with Professor Lockie Patterson from Te Tumu um, at the University of Otago. And what I want to do is address the importance of Māori women's voices and experiences to rethinking our war histories in this country. Now, many of you may be familiar with the 28th Māori Battalion's significant role in New Zealand's military action overseas during World War II. But what did war mean for Māori families on the home front? Where are the stories and accounts of how communities coped during war? For women, it meant looking after whānau, but also living with fear. As one woman reflected, um, and I quote, I did not want my husband to go to the war, end quote. But she acknowledged too, and I quote again, that she had bitter feelings, especially about the burden that fell on the woman with the young men away. So our project, Tahu Kainga, addresses how Māori communities, civilians and their families were shaped by the wartime experience at home. Our aim is to tell the story of the Second World War from marae, from churches, from workplaces, schools and farms, as well as the cities, and the places where Māori lived, where they worked and where they raised families. Alongside these stories, we are looking at how Māori communities negotiated with the state around really big, significant issues, such as land, housing, labour relations and historic injustices, during a period of major change um, in terms of Māori political engagement, and at a time when the state expanded its reach into Māori communities and lives. In effect, we argue, the Second World War as a window onto the Māori world of the 1940s, um, a decade that has been a critical one in Māori history, but often under-examined, and also a critical decade in Aotearoa's history. Indeed, historians have argued that the war was foundational to a whole range of significant transformations in Māori life post-war, such as urbanisation, for instance. But historians often make this argument uh, from 1945, without addressing the war experience uh, in any detail. And with Tahou Kainga, stories from the Māori home front, we're aiming to bring that war experience into the mix so that we can um, transform our understanding uh, of the 1940s and the role that war played um, in women's lives and the lives of families and communities in the 1940s. So our project moves away from accounts of the Second World War uh, its course and its consequences and military campaigns to other mobilizations in order to revise historical interpretations. This means we ask different questions. We ask questions about whose historical experiences are missing. And we also have to widen the definition of what constitutes war service. Now we can look at this in a number of ways for Māori women. We can look at this through directed labor, known as manpowering, and through military service. Uh, for instance. Now Māori women's uh, war effort was industrial and agricultural, as we can see here with this image of mainly Māori women workers at Patamohoi Gardens in Pokokoi during the 1940s. Historians have revealed the importance of women's industrial conscription to laying the foundations for Māori urbanisation post-war but the rural sector has been little explored. The post-war shift to urban life um, that's a focus of our scholarship has marginalized the fact that it was in rural areas where most Māori women worked. 
They worked on gardens, such as these women, in fruit picking and in shearing. And also, in terms of government-directed conscription into essential work, looking at rural and seasonal work shows that Māori women actually contested um, manpower regulations imposed by the government. Ngāti Kahununu women, for instance, uh, who were working in the shearing industry and supported by the unionist Bob Tutaki, argued that just as military service was voluntary for Māori during the Second World War, then conscription could not be applied to Māori labour either. The other area of work and service for women was in the military. Māori women were part of the 75,000 women who volunteered for the Women's War Services Auxiliary, or the WWSA, which coordinated the female war effort nationally. And they were also among the thousands of women who volunteered for the Air Force, or the WAF, the Army, the WAC, and the Navy, the RENS. So far in our project, we've identified just over 300 Māori women who joined up. And that excludes those women who were nurses and voluntary aides who eventually served overseas. And that number is relatively small, maybe only seven or eight people. Now, the small number of women in uniform um, is explained by the nature of Māori women's employment. Despite contesting the control of government manpower regulations, Māori women were in essential work and they found it almost impossible to obtain permission from manpower officers to join the auxiliaries. When the auxiliaries were first established, employers were concerned at the impact that might have on industrial mobilization. But it turned out that the majority who joined the army were in fact from shops and offices. And so industry breathed a sigh of relief as they felt that the impact would be minimal. But it was a different story for Māori women who were mainly in food production like these women that you see here. And this employment pattern influenced how many were actually able to serve in uniform and how many were able to gain permission to join uh, the army, the air force or the navy. Those who did join up did so for a range of reasons. The patriotism, uh, for better employment conditions and the potential to escape uh, less attractive work in factories and food production. Because they had Fano in the forces, a brother uh, or a husband. And because they wanted adventure, many often joined up with their friends. But the fact that women joined their auxiliaries uh, wasn't without controversy in the Māori world. Some regarded it as low paid menial work. They felt that it wasn't a real wardrobe. And because of this, it did not fit with an argument that was being made at the time for the 28th Māori Battalion that war service uh, was the price of citizenship. Nonetheless, those Māori women who did enter the auxiliaries also entered a range of trades in the armed forces. Um, and those were a range of skilled trades. Um, but they found little opportunity to continue in these areas after the war ended because the government rehabilitation program focused on servicemen. The fact that the number of Māori women who served overseas and at home was small meant that they got very little attention from the rehabilitation program set up by the government. Plus, women didn't stay in the services for very long. They often left uh, relatively quickly and meant that they didn't come under the rehabilitation program. They often had to leave due to family responsibilities. Um, one woman here um, who wrote in 1943 um, asked for release from the army. She said, I would like to apply for my release from the army as soon as possible. The reason being that my two brothers are now overseas and my parents find it impossible to procure help on the farm. My son, who has lived with my parents since I went into the army, has now started school. And my mother finds it too big a hardship to look after the house, my son, and help on the farm too. My mother finds it impossible to carry on unless I am home to help her. Now of the 136 Māori women who were recorded by the rehabilitation department in 1947, the majority had entered paid employment on their own terms after the discharge from the services, um, or they had married. So, at a time uh, when after nearly three decades, uh, the Mana Wahine inquiry has finally started, there is no better time to be bringing Māori women's histories to the fore. A historical scholarship needs their voices. 
Indeed, the Waitangi Tribunal's um, Military Veterans Inquiry is illuminating women's stories at the moment. One claimant to the Military Veterans Inquiry noted in their evidence how the, and I quote, mother became the sole income earner for our family. She had to work, but she didn't receive the equivalent of what men were getting paid, end quote. Mana wahene is important, said another. And I quote again, while we acknowledge what our men did, life had to continue while they were away. And it was the woman who made sure it continued. And let's not forget that, end quote. So Māori women were central to the war effort in the 1940s. And that's where they should be in our historical scholarship. They were not marginal to war, but they formed an important component of a momentous and transformative event in global history. Kia ora.